Good evening. If people could continue to come in and take a seat, I think we'd like to get started right on time tonight. My name is Laura Rubin. I'm the director of the Huron River Watershed Council, and I want to welcome you all to Washtenaw Community College to our hearing on public information hearing on PFAS. I want to thank you for coming out on a, on a cold night and also very close to the holidays. Um, we are pleased to be co-hosting this event with Washtenaw County and the city of Ann Arbor. Um, this was an event that we had thought about holding off until January, but with some of the more recent um, data and information and news that's been released, we thought that this would be a very timely meeting. Um, so I'm going to give just a brief overview a little bit about why we're here tonight. Um, I think most of you have read about the issue of PFAS in the Huron. Um, these are chemicals that have been around and in our environment for over 30 years. Um, in the Huron, we became aware of them much more recently, um, started testing for them at a preliminary level about five years ago. And it's only really been in the last year that Michigan has really taken a leadership role on investigating PFAS and trying to put more resources to it. And then the monitoring has stepped up, the information, the awareness, um, and our engagement. Um, it was only this summer that the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality really started doing extensive PFAS testing um, in the surface water and in the groundwater and in the fish. Um, and then everything has moved very rapidly after that. Uh, we had our first fish advisory in August, and that extended to the entire river. We found a main source up in Wixom. Um, we've had some success with that, and we're continuing to learn and get more information back. And that's really the purpose of tonight's meeting, um, is to share information with you all about what we know, uh, what we don't know, um, helping define the scope of the project and bringing the community awareness on this issue up to speed. Um, there's also state policy implications. Um, the Huron River Watershed Council has been working hard to try to get a statewide drinking water standard and additional cleanup monies. Um, also greater transparency on the data, on the regulations, and all of that will help us gain a better understanding and awareness in the community about how we can tackle this problem. When you came in the door, I hope you all got a card with information about PFAS. It directs you to our website, and we have links then to the state and the county and the city website. We try to keep that up to date. And then on the back, it also has the list of speakers. Um, the way that it will work tonight is we'll spend about the first hour with the presenters here on this slide that you see providing data and information. And then the second hour, we have cards that we'll be passing around with questions, and we'll be taking a Q&A from the audience. Before I introduce the presenters, I want to introduce Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. Um, she's here with us tonight and has been a great partner in trying to address and understand the PFAS issues. Uh, she, this summer, called for a hearing in the House and she actually was successful in bringing the EPA um, and the Region 5 representatives to our watershed to hear about some of the issues that we were struggling with. So, Debbie, if you'd like to come up and say a couple words of welcome, that would be great. Well, good evening, everyone. And it's great to see so many people here. You know, um, Laura, I really want to thank Laura and all of the panelists for all the work that they're doing and being vigilant on so many issues. When I, we started to hear about PFAS, she has been a teacher and a mentor to me as I try to learn uh, what the, and I see the sign up there on Gelman and we are going to work our tish off continuing to fight uh, and get EPA uh, and MDEQ. We have a new head of MDEQ coming in January, which is hopefully going to change the direction of environmental policy, at least in this state. I'm going to say that. But uh, Laura's been a great teacher. So when I, we, uh, Fred Upton and I asked the chair 
of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Democrats weren't in charge at that point. We still aren't. We've got a couple of weeks until we are. Uh, asked him to have a hearing. So when EPA came in, came in, Laura really helped me know the kinds of questions to go right for. One of them was EPA was blowing Michigan. We wanted them to come to Michigan, and I still don't understand why they weren't, but we got them to commit that day to come. And the day that they came, Laura was participating in an Oakland County uh, public forum like this, and I said, "Can we? Could would she help organize one in Washtenaw? Because Oakland County has been identified as a source, but everybody's been worried for some time. But nobody has the information. And when this date got picked, she tried to work with a lot of stakeholders to find the date. We had no idea that it was going to be the day that the governor released the results in a 99-page study of what his PFAS uh, advisory committee had been studying on the issues. So that came forward today. Nobody here has had the time to read all 99 pages. There are 17 recommendations and I think another three or four. Laura got to, they didn't invite me to the webinar, I don't know why. Um, uh, but one of the recommendations that I did get to when I skimmed this very quickly was the fact that there is, there is no federal guideline. There is no state guideline. There is a federal, or a standard, I'm sorry, there is no federal standard. So there is a federal guideline that says you should try not to exceed 70 parts uh, per trillion. But this study says there, there's enough indication that the guideline, not the standard, the guideline is not high enough and EPA needs to set it higher. To me, it is unacceptable when we, and all this, appear, I mean, when I read it, I mean, I really, this, I have not read these 99 pages, but I was talking to Laura about my skimming, and it's all, we need to study more. At what point are we gonna stop studying and start worrying about what the impact that these pollutants are having in our environment on the younger generation, our current generations, and older generations? So I'm going to introduce legislation the very first week that we are back in the new Congress about requiring EPA to set a standard. And it's not just the water. Here, we care about the Huron, and the Huron River, by the way, connects, comes from Oakland County, comes through here, and goes all the way down through the rest of the 12th District, Flat Rock, and then into Lake Erie. We need to know, we need to get more information. I, I, people are testing the water, they're watching it, but Laura's the one that taught me this. Do you know that the fish that they caught that then led to the warning, do not eat the fish in the Huron River, was caught a year before that announcement came out. A year. And put in a freezer and not tested. Why? Why do we not have the, what we need to be doing to test to keep people safe in Michigan? So we're going to hear from a lot of the experts tonight, but we've got to make a lot of noise. We have to, at the grassroots level, organize from one end of the state to another, because we know that the Department, the, uh, Department of Defense has done PFAS contamination in several of the military bases around this state. What is that impact? There are more questions than there are answers, and we've got a state legislature right now that is managing the gut what weak environmental legislation we've had on the books for the last eight years. We have to make our voices heard. We have to protect our environment, not for now and for the future generations to come. So thank you for coming tonight. Everybody here, I'm gonna be sitting in with Evan Pratt, the drain commissioner uh, from Washtenaw County who I work with on many issues. There's a lot of city council, other elected uh, Ann Arbor city council members, a lot of, we all really care about this, and we are all going to work together to try to bring action for what needs action. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Debbie. That kicks us off, and we're going to start right away with um, Jerry Tiernan, who's the district manager from the Jackson District Office of the MDEQ. 
And I would like to remind people, please keep your questions to the end of all of the presenters. We'll have time to get to them. Thank you again. My, uh, my name is uh, Gerald Tiernan. I'm with the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, I want to say thanks to everyone uh, for being here tonight, all the residents for sure, all the local unit of government officials, representative, uh, Congressman Dingle, thank you. So uh, again, I'm with uh, Jackson District. I'm the regional PFAS lead for MPART, so our district covers Washtenaw County uh, and uh, Jackson. So uh, we're just going to start with a little bit of information about PFAS as an emerging contaminant. Uh, specifically, an emerging contaminant is uh, any chemical or material that uh, have pathways to enter the environment and present real or potential unacceptable human health or environmental risk. And I'm trying to make sure I read this because it's a definition. And either do not have peer-reviewed human health standards or standards regulations are evolving due to new science detection capabilities or pathways. Um, you know, we have this little note here too. You know, an emergency, emerging contaminant does not mean that it's a, a new issue, but rather that the health effects and the fate and transport are not well understood. Okay. I was cutting out there, so I wanted to make sure I find a happy medium. So thank you. Uh, some of the PFAS uses uh, over the historical um, the manufacturing operations, aerospace, apparel, uh, building and construction, uh, some of the bigger ones, uh, aqueous film and, and foaming, uh, firefighting foams. Um, it was also used healthcare and hospitals, some electronics, chemicals. Um, there were, there's many uses. Uh, in November 13th of 2017, the Governor Snyder uh, signed Executive Director of uh, Dire Executive Directive 2017-1, uh, which ensure or uh, set up the MPART structure in which we currently work under, um, and it was designed to ensure comprehensive, cohesive, timely resources to conduct and mitigate uh, PFAS actions across Michigan, uh, with a goal to uh, provide uh, cooperation and coordination among all levels of government. Um, so as you see tonight, we have a whole host of, of state folks and local unit of government folks and here talking about this issue, and that's been a big part of MPART, uh, was to build this organizational framework um, uh, for, for coordination across all the state agencies and all levels of, of government to facilitate a, a, a cohesive response. So the goals uh, that MPART set forth were protecting public health, uh, proactive efforts, um, working with communities, assisting responsible parties in remediation efforts, and really trying to increase the scientific understanding of PFAS in the environment. A uh, quick talk about criteria and guidelines. As has been discussed, um, there is no enforceable uh, maximum contaminant level. Uh, issued by the federal government. Um, there is only the EPA Lifetime Health Advisory, and, and that for drinking water is 70 parts per trillion of either PFAS, I'm sorry, of PFOA, P-F-O-A, or P-F-O-S, or the combination of the two greater than 70. Um, and that's for what we would call drinking water, finished drinking water. Uh, for groundwater, it's uh, 70 PPT for PFAS, uh, PFOA or PFOS combined or individually, and that is an enforceable standard under Part 201 of environmental remediation, and that uh, criteria took effect on January 10th of 2018. Um, additional criteria that we have, uh, guidelines, are the surface water quality standards, which is the Rule 57 standards, and those call for PFOS, PFOS, by itself is 11 PPT in a protected drinking water source or a 12 for a non-drinking uh, water source. And for PFOA, it's 420 PPT for a drinking water source or 12,000 PPT for a non-drinking water source. And there's a, a few other 
um, information about the chemical and some of the calculations that have been done with respect to criteria development. So, um, you know, this slide we've included in a lot of our presentations to provide a little bit more of a backdrop for when we start talking about parts per trillion. Uh, you know, we were in the 80s, parts per million. In the 90s, we went to parts per billion. And, and now we're starting to talk about contaminant levels and the parts per trillion. And this is just one of the, the figures that, that have been put together. And basically, you know, one part per trillion is equal to about one drop in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So, you know, that in itself, you know, kind of addresses some of the why we haven't moved sooner would be the science evolving for us to be able to see things uh, down into the parts per trillion in an environmental media. Um, so as we, we talk more and more about the things that, that MPART and DEQ and some of the other state agencies have been looking at, we start to look at some of the more uh, PFAS cycle information. So how does this stuff get into the environment? And uh, you know how does it behave? How does it get into the into the rivers? How does it get into the groundwater? And looking at all the various different ways that it can end up in the environment, um, this here kind of gives you a good overview of some of the different ways um, that PFAS can enter the environment. So as we start to look at potential sources, we start to look um, at, at a lot of these types of industries, and we're trying to prioritize the ones that look at first. And, and go through them all. And that's what we've been trying to do here in the Huron River watershed. So another part of what MDOT has set out to do uh, was the, a big statewide municipal drinking water testing initiative. Um, so the DEQ has completed this statewide sampling effort for all schools that have well water and all community water supplies. In uh, November of 2018, we actually also expanded this testing to include all child care providers and Michigan Head Start programs that are listed as type two, non-transient, non-community water supplies in Michigan. Um, so those would, you know, are specific types of wells that are being used by these types of organizations. Uh, that testing was uh, collected in November and we expect to get uh, results back beginning in late December of 2018. Again, we have, uh, MPART and the state of Michigan has a, a website, which is on this slide, and, and you can start almost anything you want to find out about PFAS is on this website that the state knows about, and that's at michigan.gov backslash PFAS response, one word. So you can click on that. This one, if you click on treatment and testing, you can get a list of all of the sampling data. Now that was for municipal water. Part of the discussion after a few of the meetings that we've had with local units of government and talking to some of our other partners was the potential that there were some uh, residential wells uh, that were close to the watershed or close to the river in itself near Norton Creek. Um, there was a question that a lot of our scientists had, had discussed and, and identified as a potential issue. Uh, we were lucky enough that we have um, a Dr. Heidman um, working with us, and he took a look at some various uh, well logs and some other GIS information and kind of came up with this map, which it actually looks a lot better, even though it's pretty busy. Um, but in, in a nutshell, so all the little dots on the map are drinking water wells, the top of the map is the Norton, the whole area is kind of the Norton Creek area, which is up Wixom ways. Um, all the little dots are all the wells that we could find in that area, and the shading is based on how deep they are. So the purple ones are extremely deep, and then when you see the little yellow dots, they're a little bit more, sh they're, they're shallower. Um, Dr. Heidman, in looking at this, he looked at, well, what is the, the potential that the contaminated surface water body would be uh, transmitted to a well? And in thinking about that a little bit more, he deduced that the most likely, um, I, I, so most likely Norton Creek in itself is a gaining stream, which means the water flows from the surface or from the ground to the river. 
But there are, out of abundance of caution, there's the potential that a low water level in the well and the pumping of the drinking water well itself, there would be the potential or could be the potential that that contaminated surface water would be drawn into the well. So a long story short, we have decided to test uh, quite a few properties within the red area there. And I don't have the addresses and, and those individual owners will be, will be contacted. So this is just kind of our first um, you know, kind of roll out to people about when we'll be doing it. A state contractor will be conducting the sampling. They plan to start doing this work in early of 2019. And uh, you know, we will do contacting of the residents and sampling homes when we get permission to do so. Um, my last slide here is a, another plug for the website. We have a pretty detailed uh, watershed timeline on our website. Uh, this is how to get there on our PFAS response website. You can click on PFAS sites, lakes and streams, select Huron River, and we have and been updating that uh, with all the response that the state has conducted to this point. And so with that, I'm gonna bring up Stephanie here to talk more about the uh, surface water sampling. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Hi, I am Stephanie Kamer. I work in the DEQ with the Water Resources Division. Uh, normally I'm the Lansing District Supervisor and our district covers Livingston County area. Right now I've been working um, pretty much full time on PFAS for different issues. Uh, for the Water Resources Division, including working quite a bit on the Huron River. So I get to go through all the different efforts the DEQ is doing to not only identify concentration levels in the Huron River, but look for sources, um, not just the ones that we know, but maybe you know what other sources are out there that we should be looking at. And the, the things that I'm gonna go through, and I'm gonna try to go through it quickly, um, there's a lot of, there's three different DEQ divisions and several program and several program staff that are all involved in this. It's, it's a pretty intensive effort, like Laura mentioned. Um, a lot of those staff came here tonight so that if we get specific questions from you guys that we can provide, you know, pretty specific answers back. So um, to get started, you know, if you've been following what's going on in the Huron River, you probably know that there's the Do Not Eat Fish Advisory. So what data has the DEQ been collecting that's helped, that is being provided to DHHS to inform that advisory? And this map is kind of an overall watershed of the Huron River showing all the different water bodies where we have uh, fish that have been collected or are planned to be collected in 2019. And for some of those water bodies where we do have the fish analysis back already, we provided the concentration levels for PFOS. And, the, and just to note, you know, Jerry went through parts per trillion. When we're talking about fish tissue and PFAS, we're talking about parts per billion. So it's a little bit of a different unit. Um, the main thing I wanna point out with this slide is that the Kent Lake, which is up in Oakland County in the Metro Parks, um, continues to be the highest uh, uh, concentration levels that we've found for PFOS in fish. So in addition to fish collection, another thing that we do is we've been sampling pretty intensely in this uh, surface water. And uh, I say surface water, and that's just a fancy term to say all the rivers, lakes, and streams, and county drains um, that make up the watershed. Uh, initially, back in 2018, we had some data from the city of Ann Arbor for some river sampling that they had done as part of their water treatment plant process. Um, but we didn't really have a good look of the watershed as a whole. So in July, uh, the first sampling effort was to look at the entire stretch of the watershed. And once we got the results back, it was pretty evident um, where we needed to start looking for sources. Um, up in the northern, like upper reaches and the right hand side up there is the Norton Creek area. It's the, the levels that came back were 5,500 parts per trillion, which is very elevated. Our water quality standard, like Jerry covered, would be 11 or 12 parts per trillion. Parts per trillion. Um, so when we looked at that and we looked at the Kent Lake the fish tissue data, we saw a correlation there. Kent Lake is downstream of Norton Creek and the Milford area, so that's where we've been prioritizing um, the initial round of looking for sources. So what do we know? 
Uh, in the Norton Creek area, we had another initiative going on that was going on at the same time, working with our wastewater plants. Um, so we already knew that we had a confirmed kind of elevated source of PFAS to Norton Creek, which was the Wixom Wastewater Treatment Plant. And when I say we already knew, we knew within like a couple weeks. So we got all this data in within a month. We had some results that came in in June and others that came in in July, but they were all kind of coming in at the same time. Um, in addition, uh, Wixom had been doing, uh, looking into their sanitary sewer system. They had identified a uh, metal finisher, which was Tribar Manufacturing, as being the source of PFAS into their system. And um, I'm not gonna talk much more about Wixom because I know the city's here and I'm gonna let him um, talk about their actions that they've been working on. Um, but we did wanna stop with Wixom. You know, we had these elevated levels. We didn't wanna just um, assume that Wixom was our only source. We wanted to make sure we got a full uh, comprehensive look at Norton Creek and some of the surrounding areas around Kent Lake. So, the, you know, we got those results back in July. I wanna say within days. We were already planning to say, okay, where else do we need to look? We were meeting with DEQ staff and talking to our surface water folks, and they put a plan together, and in August went back out and did a pretty intensive um, follow-up sampling, uh, looking at Norton Creek, looking at some of the significant tributaries there. Uh, part of that sampling, we also went to some uh, permitted discharges. So they're direct discharges that would take wastewater or groundwater cleanup water treat it, and then discharge it directly to surface waters. Uh, we sampled those sites. I'm not gonna go into details on, on all of them, but basically for the uh, discharges that are listed and also included two wastewater treatment plants, uh, we didn't get any uh, significant levels of PFAS. So we've been pretty much able to eliminate all six of those sites um, that I've lifted, listed up there at this point. Uh, another thing that we worked on was there was a Lion Development Landfill. It's a closed landfill. It's located kind of in close proximi proximity to Kent Lake. So there was a question, you know, could contaminated uh, groundwater be infiltrating to Kent Lake from the landfill? We worked with a responsible party for the landfill who sampled eight uh, monitoring wells for PFAS. Uh, they got the results back and they were very low or non-detect. I think most of them were non-detect, which is, you know, I think great news for the watershed. Um, or, and I think the one result they had was less than two parts per trillion. So we've eliminated that as a potential source as well. Uh, another site that stood out that we wanted to look at was the Ford Wixom assembly plant. Uh, it's located kind of in the upper parts of Norton Creek down by the freeway. Uh, we did sample stormwater and some ponding water and receiving streams right next to the plant. Uh, we did get a little bit higher levels, and I say high, it was like 30 parts per trillion from the stormwater, but once it got into the receiving stream, the receiving stream was meeting our water quality standards at a 12 parts per trillion or lower. So, you know, compared to what we were seeing downstream of Wixom, the, we have a little bit of PFAS at Ford, but we don't really think it's contributing to the issues that we were seeing downstream. So all of that that I kind of went through, and I'm going through it really quickly, just because I'm trying to make sure the other speakers have a chance to talk. Um, all that happened in July, uh, August, and September. Um, after the August sampling event, we got the results back. Uh, we looked at the data, it's an iterative process. We look at the data. Um, we consider what it tells us, and we decided that, you know, you know what, we needed to go out and do some more sampling. I know we don't want to hear that we need to keep looking at it, but again, we don't want to miss something. So in October, we put together another plan. Uh, we went back to some of the areas that we had visited in Norton Creek and some of those tributaries to get some more data. And then we also um, didn't have much information kind of below Kent Lake. You know, we only had a couple of sample points from July, uh, we were getting a lot of questions about what is the water quality. I live on Strawberry Lake. What is the water quality by me? Um, so we actually sampled uh, quite a few more locations below Kent Lake uh, to below Baseline Lake. And then also, I'm not on this map, uh, looking at several tributaries where we have streams coming in to the Huron River um, at various locations. Uh, we didn't include the tributary results on here because they were all non-detect, and we couldn't, I don't think we could get them to show up 
that well. Um, but the one thing I do want to point out from the October uh, results are, is if you look up in the right-hand corner, um, some of those results are Norton Creek. Uh, if you look at the 75 and the 88, you know, back in July, where that 88 is, that's where we had the 5,500 parts per trillion. Um, I think when we came back in August, it was around 1,900 parts per trillion. So in October, it's down to 88. And the things that's changed in between then is that work that Tribar has done and Wixom has done. So I think we're seeing a positive impact there. And I'm hoping that we'll continue to see that trend keep going down. Uh, the one thing, um, when you sample, you know, you might get results that you can't quite explain. So the, um, with the October results, while what's happening up in Norton Creek is positive, we see it coming down. Um, when we got below uh, kind of the Island Lake recreation area, we started seeing these higher sampling points. And, you know, I'm talking about the 65, the 46, the 88. And then as you come down, uh, Argo Pond was at 42, and, or no, excuse me, Barton Pond was at 42, and Argo Pond was at 37. So back in July, when we sampled, we had two points, and they were around 15 and 11. And I know the Ann Arbor Water Treatment Plant has seen similar, similar results in their October sampling at Barton Pond. So I guess the question is, you know, what's happening? You know, or what's going on? Why is the levels going up? And I guess I can't give you a good answer. Um, we don't have a lot of data. Uh, I think sampling surface waters is very variable. Um, we only we have a July sample. We have an October sample. And so we don't know at this point, you know, is these levels something we see? Are they coming down from the Wixom area? Or is there a new source or an existing source that we just didn't pick up in the July sampling? So um, what we're doing, though, because we don't want to just sit there and just ponder on it, we are putting some action in, and I want to share some data for kind of that area, that focus area. Uh, one of the areas, if you can see it with the arrows, is Horseshoe Creek. Um, that is one of the few tributaries we didn't sample, so we don't have any surface water data on that. When we went back and shared these results with DEQ staff that are really familiar uh, with Livingston County, um, they brought up that there were some potential sites um, in the Hamburg Township area. There was a couple of fires that they think AFFF foam was used within the last 15 years. Um, there's also some other sites, some cleanup sites, and a couple landfills. So we're going to go back and sample the surface water at Horseshoe Creek and try to get more data and see if that, you know, that seems reasonable that we should be looking there to identify if there's another source. Some of the other uh, things we've done in the Washtenaw and Livingston County areas, there is currently uh, an ongoing active groundwater investigation at the former Diamler Chrysler SIO facility. Um, they have detected PFAS, including PFOS, in wells near um, the Huron River that would be above our GSI, or groundwater surface water interface criteria. Um, again, that criteria would be 11 or 12 parts per trillion, so they are above it. I think they're around 60 parts per trillion for PFAS, so they're not sky high, but it would be above criteria. Um, they're going to continue, our waste management division is going to work with the responsible party there to do some additional monitoring and include maybe looking at the stormwater to make sure there isn't um, contaminated groundwater infiltrating the storm sewers and coming to the river that way. Some, some additional things that we know about discharges um, to the river and to the surrounding tributaries in this area is that we have three wastewater treatment plants that are currently going through a peace class initiative similar to what Wixom went through, where they're inventorying their industrial users to their system, looking for PFAS potential of, of, you know, did they use it in the past, and is there potential they're discharging it to the wastewater plant? Uh, Dexter and Lyon Township, uh, Dexter and Lyon Township, I, have, I had that wrong on my slide this morning, so I want to make sure I got that right this time. Um, both have completed that process. Uh, Dexter sampled their effluent, and they were like three parts per trillion for PFAS. Uh, Lyon Township actually didn't have any users that had a potential, so um, we don't think that they're contributing anything um, to the watershed. 
Brighton is still going through the process. They're under review, review right now. Based on what we've seen from them, we're not expecting them to be a significant source, but we haven't quite made the determination yet. In addition to the wastewater plants, uh, we had four direct discharges that we sampled. Um, the Sweepster Harley f attachments facility happens to operate on the same site as the former Diameter Chrysler facility, so we wanted to, to sample this, their discharge. We got the results back, I think, yesterday, um, and they were less than 1.3 parts per trillion, so basically um, very little PFAS in the discharge. Uh, Paul Life Science, Sciences was also sampled, and they came back non-detect. They came back non-detect for all PFAS analytes, so there was 24 compounds that were analyzed, and they were non-detect for all, and that's preliminary data. Like I just said, we just got it yesterday, so it hasn't went through extensive review, um, but I wanted to share it. Uh, there's also two groundwater cleanup sites that are managed by the DEQ in the watershed. Uh, one's located in Brighton and one's in the Gregory area. We sampled those at the end of November and the results are still out, so we're gonna wait and see what those results come back on. Uh, and then I already talked about the Horseshoe Creek sampling. So that's kind of where we're at, kind of looking at, where, you know, you see that elevation and kind of the work that we're doing to try to um, see if there's other potential sources in those areas. Uh, one, one thing that we also looked at during the October sampling um, is the Portage Lake and its, its tributaries that drain to it. Portage Lake is not on the main stem of the Huron River, so anything from Wixom isn't going to influence what you find in Portage Lake. And in um, September uh, or October, we were receiving complaints of foam and I think people were concerned that it was PFAS foam. Uh, we also had some fish tissue results that had some PFAS in it, so in trying to make sure that we identify any potential sources, uh, they looked at tributaries coming into the lake, and the results were really low, uh, less than one part per trillion or non-detect. So no real uh, smoking gun there. It doesn't appear that there's a significant source, but again, these are grab samples and a kind of a snapshot in time at the day of the monitoring. And again, the, we do have that one uh, cleanup site that would be upstream of the lake uh, that we're waiting on samples from. So what's next? Um, I kind of went through this already, but we are gonna continue to monitor progress at Tribar and the Wixom Wastewater Treatment Plant. This is part of our, our normal framework, the IPP program um, that we're used to working with. So we'll continue working with them on that. Uh, it will, they'll continue to work at the Diamler Chrysler SIO facility. Uh, we'll look at you know, continuing our investigation for potential sources. So it's an iterative process. We're gonna follow the data. As we get new data in, we're gonna put together a plan, kind of methodically work through the watershed um, to make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, an additional fish analysis, so there's some additional um, sites that are already planned to be collected. And in 2019, um, Joe Bohr, who kind of runs that program, it seems like every time I hear him talk, he's saying, oh, maybe we should add that lake too. So I think that'll continue on. Um, additional stream samples needed, like in the Horseshoe Creek area or other areas that pop up. Uh, the residential well sampling, which will come in early 2019, and then we'll hopefully continue to engage the public and let you know what we're doing and keep you informed. All right, uh, my name is Gary Clace. I'm a toxicologist with NDHHS, the Department of Health and Human Services. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Um, I'm here to talk a little more about the health side of PFAS and the fish advisories, a little bit about the foam, and a few of the other things that we have going on. So at DHHS, we handle a variety of roles related to protecting the public health. These include working with state and local agencies to evaluate environmental data, such as PFAS levels in fish and water, and working to coordinate public health responses when they're necessary. So we're often on the front lines helping distribute bottled water, distributing filters when people's water are above these numbers. Um, 
We also work to stay current on the science of PFAS to help make sure our teams are up to date on the latest public health policy and research for these chemicals. Now, we talked about this number earlier. Um, one of the main numbers that we work with in PFAS is called the US EPA Lifetime Health Advisory Number, or LHA. And this is the number that the US EPA came out with that they say will protect everyone, including infants and unborn children from the, from the harmful effects of PFAS. Um, the EPA set this number at 70 parts per trillion, or PPT, that you'll see sometimes. And this number was developed using toxicity studies that were conducted in rats and mice. And then they add in some very large safety factors to make sure that everybody is protected. Um, a little misprint on the slide, this protects against both cancer and non-cancer effects, not just the non-cancer effects. So one thing about PFAS is that these are not new chemicals. They've been around 30, 40, or more years. Um, they have been used in a lot of consumer products and in industry and even food packaging. So these are things people have been exposed to for a long time and haven't even known it. And they're now being removed from a lot of these uses due to the health effects. Um, so one piece of good news that often gets lost is the fact that PFAS levels have been coming down in the blood of Americans and people in uh, other countries as well because regulations have been removing these from the products we use in our home and from the environment. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done to remove these chemicals from the environment, but the exposures are declining. The amount of the amount of the chemicals people are ingesting is going down quite a bit. This, this slide shows some of the health effects that PFAS chemicals can cause. Uh, in people, these include, they can alter your cholesterol levels, they can cause thyroid disease, ulcerative colitis, testicular and kidney cancer, and they can change the way your immune system functions, which especially for younger children can um, reduce how well vaccines work if they've been exposed to PFAS chemicals. So this past August, DHH, DHHS issued a do not eat fish advisory for the Huron River based on high levels of PFAS chemicals that we saw in the fish from, uh, particularly from Kent Lake. The advisory currently extends from the Huron River in Wixom all the way down to Lake Erie, plus Norton Creek, and that includes about 15 or 16 lakes and ponds that are associated with the river. The Do Not Eat advisory was first placed on the Huron in August from Milford to the Washtenaw County line, and these were based on high PFAS levels that we saw in fish taken from Kent Lake. The advisory was later expanded in August to include Norton Creek based on the high levels of PFAS that the DEQ saw in the water, and then it was expanded again at the end of August based on additional fish tissue data we received from Baseline Lake and Argo Pond. Now, additional fish tissue data has been collected from more locations to see if we need to um, extend the advisory any further. But right now, it looks like I think we've got it covered. Um, as one of the slides earlier also showed, there have been some questions about the PFAS foam that can form on lakes. And the important thing here is, and, and this sounds like common sense, but we're going to say it, don't eat it. So. PFAS doesn't really go through your skin very well, so if you were to touch it, you know, that's not really a health hazard, although I wouldn't recommend touching it just to be safe and would definitely wash your hands afterwards because you, you just don't, there's high level of PFAS in it, you don't want it getting in your mouth. Um, I would keep pets away, I would keep children away just because both pets and children have a tendency to put things in their mouth no matter what you tell them. So. Um, but the takeaway message there is it's not going to hurt you if you touch it. It could hurt you if you eat it. And then, you know, finally, we'll do another plug for the website. Um, Michigan.gov slash PFAS response has a lot of up-to-date current information on both the chemicals as well as, um, you know, the sites that we know about and what the state's doing. So this is an excellent resource. Um, again, Michigan.gov slash PFAS response. We also have the state's toxic hotline there at the top, which is 1-800-MI-TOXICS. And that's a way that pretty much anybody can call in and talk to one of us toxicologists at DHHS. We can help answer your questions individually, um, questions about your particular situation that you might have, we can walk you through. Usually we can find an answer pretty quickly. Sometimes somebody will ask a good question, we don't know the answer, but we can go find the answer, talk to the other experts, 
and then come back and let you know what we find. And then there's some additional um, contact information that I believe the Watershed Council will make available on their website. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Laura. My name is Tim Sikma. I work for the City of Wixom in the Department of uh, Public Works. And uh, um, what, six to eight months ago, we uh, were introduced to uh, the PFAS um, problems that, that we recognized. Um, but, well, I say take that back just till February of last year. We started uh, recognizing that there was a PFAS issue. And uh, we, with our uh, sewer use ordinance and um, our industrial pretreatment program, we started investigating the scenarios, and we did find uh, in June of this year that uh, Tribar, plant number four of uh, five plants that they have in Wixom, um, was a potential source for PFAS, and we identified that as 28,000 nanograms or parts per trillion uh, at that time, discharging into our wastewater treatment plant. Now, the wastewater treatment plant uh, has no um, capabilities of treating for PFAS. Uh, as you may know, it uh, requires uh, activated carbon or a, a granular activated carbon for that, and uh, we, we did not have that at the treatment plant. So we, uh, we needed to get that out of our system by uh, talking with Tribar and uh, making them treat it before it gets to the plant. So uh, in August of uh, this year, we administered an administrative compliance order, and in that order, it uh, said there will be no more discharges of PFAS to the treatment plant. And uh, by October, they had instigated or in invested in an activated carbon system that was able to treat for PFAS. And because of the sampling techniques that are involved, it takes an enormous amount of time to get our results back. But uh, we recently uh, have received results back from Tribar saying that there, uh, there are uh, no detection in the effluent for, for uh, Tribar discharges. And that's uh, really great news. Um, our, our slides here um, indicate that uh, our discharges, unfortunately, did not reflect that uh, as much. And at the Wixom Wastewater Treatment Plant, uh, we started in uh, June sampling. We had a, a 290 effluent discharge. And in August, when we really initially instigated our, our program, it crept up to 4,800 uh, parts per trillion. And uh, that was kind of devastating for our program. We thought we were on the right track, and here we have uh, larger numbers. But since then, uh, with, with uh, Tribar's help, we started seeing a decline. And uh, as of 11.6, uh, we had uh, 240 nanograms per liter or parts per trillion. That uh, is, is recognized as a very important um, decline, as you can see throughout the months. Now, we're sampling on a monthly basis, and we're getting our results back about three weeks after we sample. So our program is, you know, continues to, uh, to show very good results. And uh, now with the non-detect from Tribar, we're expecting to, to see these numbers go down. Now, when we're talking about wastewater treatment plants, a lot of times in the solids, uh, we talk about sludge age. And now our sludge age at the, at the treatment plant right now is running about 28 days. And when we make a change to the treatment plant, it usually takes two sludge ages to actually see a positive result or a complete result uh, as we go through there. And what we're kind of expecting or seeing right now is that decline in PFAS is not quite coming down the way, um, you know, we had initially hoped. It is dramatic, you know, 95, if you look at a 95% decline, it's pretty good, but it's still 240. So, um, you know, we, we started thinking on the sludge age, and it is a, basically two months before we see 
continuous results because what we're, what we're seeing in, it was contaminated, the sludge was contaminated at a higher level and as that passes through, we'll, we hope to continue to see that decline. So um, as we see these results um, from tri-bar decline, I think it's a diminishing returns that uh, we'll also see a decline at the wastewater treatment plant. And that's also reflected in the state numbers that, uh, that we're starting to see. So um, we are very confident that uh, we can continue to get those results. So we didn't want to just stop there at Tribar. We wanted to identify some other sources or potential sources. So this is the um, arterial collection system lines at the wastewater or in the city of Wixom. All roads lead to the wastewater treatment plant, or at least all the pipes do. And um, so we divided or separated out the system into several different areas, and they're represented in different colors here on this on this uh, this map. And what we found was we took the top two results are are showing that uh, the results were um, basically threes and fours for the res residential areas. Uh, that's the pink and the blue here. And uh, we also have some small discharges from uh, Milford uh, Township, and uh, those were you know, fairly low as well. The, uh, the, two, the two samples that you, you see on the bottom, the green area was industrial areas, uh, including the Ford Wixom area that uh, hasn't been in play, um, discharging since uh, 2007. But uh, that green area we kind of, we kind of uh, checked out and uh, that was, you know, below uh, the discharge uh, limits that, that we were looking at. So the, the yellow area uh, represented the far right, which was included discharges from Tribar, uh, both plants four and plants five. And these samples were, uh, were found to be high, uh, high concentrations. So the, the blue X's kind of narrow down those samples. So as we move upstream, we're ruling out different industries as we go. And uh, that's, these are the, the results uh, that we found. Um, and so, yeah, the, we've um, basically ruled out any other, we, or we haven't identified any other sources for uh, PFAS in our collection systems at this time. And uh, we will continue to look as uh, the sample results uh, reflect better numbers. So, thank you. So I'm Sarah, I'm the water quality manager for the city of Ann Arbor, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about um, the actions that the city has taken with respect to PFAS. Um, so as has been, I think, mentioned tonight, in 2014, um, the US EPA required water utilities of a certain size to sample for a bunch of compounds in what is called the unregulated contaminant monitoring. Um, and PFAS was in that monitoring. And so that was the first time that we ever had detected PFAS in Ann Arbor drinking water. Um, after that detection, uh, we did some sampling in March of 2016 to understand where that might be coming from. We, it's fairly common for PFAS contamination to come from groundwater. Um, and so we tested both the wells that we have at that are south of the city at the municipal airport and we tested the Huron River. And it was immediately clear that the Huron River was actually the source and we have not detected PFAS in any of the well samples that we've taken. So then from 2016 to 2017, um, we, have, we were conducting regular monitoring of PFAS in both the Huron River and uh, the Ann Arbor drinking water. Um, and has been, as has been stated before, uh, this is a complicated analysis and it takes three to four weeks to get results back. Um, and the science has been changing even since 2014. So in 2014, we were only looking for, I believe, 
six compounds and the detection limits were higher than we're currently looking. Um, currently the method looks at 24 compounds and the detection limit is quite a bit lower. So even as we have gone through the past almost five years now, um, the science has been changing quite dramatically. So um, that is a really a side note from the timeline. But um, then in November of 2017, after having looked at the, year, the couple years worth of data of um, PFAS, uh, after speaking with our carbon manufacturer, we decided to um, initiate a pilot of a different type of granular activated carbon. Um, so granular activated carbon has come up a couple of times tonight, so I wanted to stop and talk about it briefly. But um, currently, GAC, or granular activated carbon filtration, is the best available technology to remove PFAS from drinking water. Um, and what I have shown up here is a picture of the pilot filters that we have at the plant that we use to test different types of carbon media to see how effective they are. So what this pilot filter is, is um, basically if you imagine that you put a straw into one of our larger filters, um, this is what it looks like. So there's some sand at the bottom and then we have about two feet of granular activated carbon on top of that and the carbon is what removes things um, and filters them out and PFAS in particular is removed by this granular activated carbon. So this is just a very small view of what we have at the treatment plant, which we have 26 of these filters. They, have, they each have a surface area of 459 square feet. So they're quite a bit larger. We have been using granular activated carbon in these filters since 1989. So uh, this is not a new technology to us. We have been using this to meet our water quality objectives for, um, for many, many years. Uh, and the thing about granular activated carbon is that there are many different types of carbon. Some comes from coal, some comes from coconut shells. Um, and these different types of carbon and the different ways that they're treated will absorb different compounds at different rates. So the the um, GAC that we were using previously absorbed PFAS, um, but in talking with our carbon manufacturer, they recommended a different product that might um, absorb PFAS um, better. So that is what prompted us to do the pilot back in 2017. Um, so we started that pilot. We were looking at that new carbon to see if we would see enhanced um, PFAS removal um, we did continue to sample. We continue to sample every single month um, to look at the concentrations um, in both the river and drinking water. And what we saw from our pilot when we looked at the data is that the average concentration of PFAS plus, plus PFOA decreased over the course of using this new carbon. So we went from an average of 7.2 in um, parts per trillion in 2017 to 3.2 in 2018. So at that point, around September, August or September of this year, we looked at the data and said, this looks promising and we want to act on it. And so um, water treatment plant staff put together a proposal and went to city council um, and they approved us in this fiscal year to replace all of our filters and have all of them have this new type of carbon media in it that is better at, at removing PFAS compounds. So um, in October of 2018, at the very end of October, we had the first round of change outs. You can't actually, um, if you're going to keep the water tre treatment plant working, you can't actually replace all of the filters all at the same time. Um, so since people still want water, we replaced about a third of them this time, um, and then we're going to replace um, the remaining two-thirds in the spring. Um, we also found out in October that we have been selected as a part of a team 
to look at new treatment technologies um, besides GAC. So um, the carbon is very good at removing some types of PFAS compounds, and it is not as effective at removing at others of them. And so um, we are actively participating in a research project to try to identify some new technologies that will help us remove even more PFAS compounds from the water. And then, as I mentioned, in the spring of 2019, we'll be replacing um, the remaining filters. So that is sort of a timeline of what we're doing with drinking water. And I guess I would like to just stress that um, in the world of drinking water, we're actually, we are one of the most proactive utilities when it comes to, um, to making these large investments without any sort of regulatory target. Um, most utilities are going to wait for there to be some sort of enforceable regulation, but we really want to make sure that we are doing the best that we can for our citizens and that we are being as protective of public health as we can. So um, I would just like to um, say that we are really working hard to try to get ahead of this problem, but the science um, is definitely evolving about as fast as we are moving. So. With that, I would just also like to say that we aren't just dealing with this from a drinking water um, standpoint. In the city of Ann Arbor, um, we've also been working with our firefighting, um, with the firefighters. So in 2016, um, firefighting foam, AFFF, that contained PFAS and PFOA was phased out. So PFAS and PFOA are what we call C8 compounds. They have an eight carbon chain. Um, and we were starting to get enough information about the health impacts of those C8 PFAS compounds, so they phased out that firefighting foam and replaced it with C6 containing PFAS firefighting foam. Um, in the intervening years, we have gotten more evidence that C6 PFAS have very similar health impacts. Um, they may not actually have the same they may not last in your body for quite as long. That is unclear. Um, but they may have some similar health impacts. And so as we've been looking at this, as we've been looking at the PFAS data in our drinking water, um, we wanted to take a, a second look at the firefighting foam in the city of Ann Arbor. And this September, when we did review the data, we saw that the firefighting foam that we were currently using um, did have um, these C6 PFAS compounds. Um, so we worked with the fire chief who immediately committed to not using that foam for any sort of training um, on, because it would likely end up in either the storm system or going to the wastewater treatment plant. And they worked very hard to identify an acceptable um, alternative that didn't contain any sort of um, PFAS. And they were able to identify something um, it does require slightly more foam to put out the same fire, but it is, they have since purchased that foam and they have committed to using it on all their fires and the PFAS containing foam that we did have was um, disposed of um, as industrial waste. So we're not just dealing with it from a drinking water standpoint, we are trying to make sure that this that we're removing sources inside of the city as well. Um, and then I would just like to show the data that we have been collecting all over all these um, years. And you can see the in the gray, that is the Huron River. And in the blue is the drinking water. So you can see that we do see fluctuations um, and we don't quite know why. And then as has been discussed earlier this, um, in this talk, um, this fall we have seen a pretty dramatic increase in concentration even as Tribar has been putting on um, the advanced treatment. And so I guess as we move, but I guess the point of this graph is that based on all of the, av all of the av available guidance, the EPA lifetime health advisory, the drinking water is still quite far below that lifetime health advisory 
Um, so that, that is the current state of where we are today. I think moving forward into the future, um, we're really watching eagerly the efforts to identify additional sources um, that the MDEQ has undertaken because as has been mentioned, it is much more efficient to remove, to treat the source and to not have us downstream trying to remove the PFAS in our water treatment um, process. It is actually more efficient to remove PFAS from a more concentrated stream um, and we get it, when we get it and it's more dilute, it is less efficient to remove it and more difficult. Um, so we are committed to ongoing monitoring. Um, we are, again, as I mentioned, upgrading the carbon in our filters. And then we are participating in this Water Research Foundation research project. And we are really hoping that some new and promising technologies are identified and tested as a part of that. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kristen. All right, hi there. Uh, I'm Kristen Schweighofer. I'm the Environmental Health Director with the Washtenaw County Health Department. And I just wanted to briefly touch on what the Health Department's role is in all of the PFAS um, investigations. So the Health Department normally permits private or home drinking water wells. Um, we also have oversight of small non-community drinking water wells. And we talked about that a little bit earlier with the schools and the daycares that are being sampled. Um, and then also importantly, we're a source of local information. Groundwater flow, um, I see the dioxane sign, we're, we're pretty engaged in that effort as well. So we have a lot of information about what's going on uh, both with our surface water, but also the groundwater in our community. So residents with well water, uh, that's probably our primary um, focus in this as well as, as those smaller water supplies. We print permit well water for private homes, we require a well record submittal. So every time a well is drilled in Washtenaw County, that record um, is sent to us and contains information on well depth, construction information, and importantly, soil types. We also require sampling for coliform bacteria, nitrates, and arsenic. As you can see, we don't normally sample for PFAS. It's not normally something we see in our groundwater locally. Um, one of the great things about our community is we have a lot of clay in our soils. So if any of you ever have a septic system you have to install, it'll be the bane of your existence because it's not a great uh, soil to dispose of wastewater, but it is considered protective for most groundwater situations. So kind of double-edged sword there. It's great for groundwater, terrible for uh, wastewater. So uh, what we did is we put together, and it's usually a 10-foot clay layer we're looking for. And just for your information, um, I would say we have probably 30 or 40,000 well water, uh, you know, residents on well water. And I would say at least 50% of those are between 70 and 120 feet deep. So these aren't shallow wells. Um, we've been permitting wells for decades. Um, so a lot of our wells are very deep and we um, are looking for a minimum of a 25 foot depth based on state criteria. And most everything we permit would have that 10 foot clay protective layer. Um, so again, we feel very confident that the wells we know about are permitted and um, are protected. That being said, we're getting new information, you know, looking at the what's happening with the Huron River. We understand that there's a lot of concerned residents. Um, but importantly, uh, we are not aware of any residential water wells in Washtenaw County with PFAS detections. Um, and if you're interested, we put together a sheet on how to access your well records for your individual home, and it's available on our website, washtenaw.org slash PFAS. Okay. So we also oversee water sampling requirements for non-community or also known as type two water supplies. And just to define that for you, that's a water supply system that provides water drinking for drinking water or potable purposes to 25 or more persons at least 60 days out of the year and has 15 or has 15 or more service connections. That's things like schools, restaurants, motels, campgrounds, and churches. Um, we have about 240 of those water systems in Washtenaw County. And as was mentioned, the schools and daycare centers on well water were sampled as part of Michigan's PFAS sampling plan. So all 24 municipal supplies were tested and the results have all been received. And as mentioned, 
multiple times. They're all available on that Michigan PFAS response website. Um, as we've already talked to, in, in that initial sampling, uh, the City of Ann Arbor Municipal Sci had the detection of 52 total PFAS in the raw water. Uh, all 11 schools on well water were tested and we had one detection and that was at Emerson Elementary School and that was at 14 total PFAS and we worked with that community to send that information out within 24 hours of when we received it to their teachers, the students, and all of the parents. They made a choice to put everyone on um, bottled water and that's where they remain to this day doing some additional research on whether or not to put in a treatment system. We are awaiting on our daycare center results. Uh, we expect those probably early January, mid-January. I know that they were all taken uh, just recently here. And I believe 15 of our 17 daycare centers have um, been sampled. I think there's two that ha had not had an opportunity to do that. And again, once those are results are available, they will be posted within, I think, 48 hours of receipt to the Washtenaw.org PFAS site, as well as the Michigan.gov PFAS response. And those are our key contacts for PFAS if you have any questions locally. I guess I could leave that up for a minute, but I know it'll all be on the Huron River Watershed Council's uh, website soon. That's all I had, Laura. Thanks. Um, so at this point, uh, we're going to open it up for your questions on the cards. Um, I do want to note, um, I've been working in the environmental field for 25 years, and when I see the kind of resources and data and the effort by all of these parties to come together, um, I'm very proud to, to be among these panelists tonight in talking about this issue because I think um, I haven't seen this kind of a response um, at the federal level in terms of monitoring for a problem like this. It doesn't say that we have all the answers, um, but we have a lot more data than we've had on many of our other issues. Uh, one of the other things to note is throughout the state of Michigan as this issue has evolved, the Huron is a little bit unique um, in that our PFAS issue is not a groundwater contamination. So when we look at Oscoda, and when we look at Rockford, and when we look at Plainwell, that's areas where PFAS has contaminated a groundwater supply, a drinking water supply. The Huron is really a unique beast in Michigan in that we're really looking at surface water. And so you'll see if you go to the state's um, either the MPART or the PFAS response, um, most of the monitoring has been focused very site specifically. This is really the one watershed that I'm aware of that they've done this comprehensive monitoring up and down the river. Um, so I hope you got a sense of the, the breadth um, and the scope of the parties that are involved in this issue and the kind of data that's being collected. Um, so at this point, I think um, if we have people walking up and down the aisles, so please fill out the cards and uh, we will start, or we'll walk over here and start getting some questions. Uh, we have a few questions that just wanting to understand the logistics of the procedure for testing the water and the fish. Um, so one question about why does it take so long? Why is there a backlog? Is there a lack of testing facilities? Does it cost a lot of money? You know, et, et, et cetera. How do you sample? So if you could give a little bit more information about the procedure for testing. Hello? If you'll introduce yourself, too. 
Oh, yes. I'm Joe Bohr. I uh, manage the fish contaminant monitoring program for the state. Um, and lately, I've been involved in some of the surface water sampling as well. Um, a little bit of history, maybe we'll clarify things a little bit. We've been sampling fish con uh, contaminants in fish statewide um, for since the 1980s on a regular basis. And the usual procedure is, has been to uh, look at whatever the, the DNR's work plans are for the year and whoever is managing the program would go through the, the list and decide uh, which lakes needed to be tested for um, to update the fish consumption advisories for one thing but also to look at general water quality problems around the state. Um, so we'd look at those lists, make a, a wish list, hand it to DNR, they'd collect most of our fish. Those would then get eventually make their way down to Lansing where they get processed as fillets um, and eventually get their way to the lab. And this is usually on a basis of the fish are collected in one year. Uh, that way we know how many samples we're going to have to analyze and we put in for the budget for the next fiscal year. So it's normally when we're, we don't know that there's a, an issue to be, to be seriously concerned about like this one, uh, it takes basically a year to get analysis back. And in that process, we also get a lot of fish that we don't have enough budget for to, to analyze. And we sometimes can retain those in our freezers and analyze them later if, we, if the budget's available. And that's basically what happened here. Um, we had fish from Kent Lake uh, that, that came to us by that process. The, the DNR was there doing some regular survey work. Uh, so I asked them to get some fish because we hadn't updated that advisory for some time. Uh, there already was, was an advisory due to PCBs and mercury. Um, so we had those fish in the freezer when it came to our attention that uh, there was a potential PFAS issue in the Huron. We decided to analyze them not just for the regular contaminants, PCBs and mercury, but we also had them analyzed for the, the PFAS. And that's when it really hit the fan when we got those numbers back because it was extremely high. It shocked everybody. Um, at the same time, we had uh, fish in the freezer that were older from Argo Pond. Uh, so we decided to put those through the process and had them analyzed pretty quickly and found out that, yes, indeed, it was a pretty big system-wide problem. Um, and that led to... In the same, at the same time, because of, of Ann Arbor's data, we decided we needed to do some, surf, uh, some uh, source tracking for PFAS. So this all happened pretty much at the same time and pretty rapid, much more rapid than normal uh, process. Um, not sure if that answers the question or not. Yeah. Uh, the next question, I think, goes more t maybe towards Chris Christian, Kristen, about um, have there been residential wells that have been tested? Um, and are there places that uh, individuals who are on private wells can take a test or get their water tested? All right, if he's on, no, it's not on. Yes. Okay, wow, all right, here I am. Um, yeah, I think we've had two individuals submit their water well tests to us, and I believe we posted those on our website as well. I'll have to double check. Um, but yeah, residents can have their wells tested, uh, both the Michigan site, PFAS site, as well as ours. Uh, I think we redirect you to the Michigan site to make sure everything's up to date. Um, have inf sources for individuals to have their water wells tested. Um, because PFAS is a chemical that's in a lot of common products, you just have to take a lot of care and preparation to uh, make sure that you're not incidentally contaminating a sample. Um, but there are uh, detailed instructions on doing that. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple other questions that get to um, Filtration effectiveness, disposal of filters, what happens to the carbon after it takes on the PFAS? How is that disposed of? Is this on? Okay. <laughs> um, so, the, that was a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> I remember the last one. <laughs> 
which is, so the, basically the PFAS com compounds are in the water at parts per trillion. There's also a lot of other things in the water at much higher concentrations. And all of that comes into contact with the carbon media in our filters. So, so what happens is a little bit of a competitive process. So you might have other organic molecules like when leaves degrade. Um, anyway, so all of that is coming onto the carbon and it is absorbing to the surface and inside there's actually pores in that carbon. So at some point, all of the available surface area in that carbon is going to be coated with organic compounds. Some of them are PFAS molecules and some of them are just other things that we've removed from the water. And so at that point, PFAS stops absorbing to the carbon. And so once we reach that point, um, it's time to dispose the carbon if that's the whole point of having that type of that carbon. So in the case of our filters, we have actually quite a few water quality parameters that we use these filters to manage. So it's not just PFAS, we also, um, we also need to remove other things with these filters. So, so anyways, there are some competing priorities and we have to figure out how to balance that. But once we decide to dispose of the carbon, um, the carbon manufacturer will actually take the carbon out of the filters and they send it to either a landfill, um, a line, well, I'm not gonna speak for them, but it's a landfill, or what happens is that the carbon is um, burned at very high temperatures, and it turns out that that's really the only way to totally destroy PFAS compounds. So, um, and the carbon manufacturer that we worked with has done tests um, to see if any PFAS make it through that regeneration process, um, and if any are coming out of the stacks during that process. So, um, theoretically, this is one potential way to actually destroy PFAS compounds. Does that hit That gets all? to it. We had many questions okay. about what happened, how do you dispose of the carbon. Um, so one question while we're on sort of carbon filtration and treatment, there's a couple questions about TRIBAR and accountability versus self-testing. How much is the DEQ or WIC and wastewater treatment plant involved or overseeing TRIBAR's monitoring? So, so the, the point is uh, trust but verify. And uh, that, that is uh, the intent of our industrial pretreatment program, but uh, also uh, I think um, that's the intent with DEQ working with us. So we are working in concert to some extent. Uh, the, the DEQ has been sampling uh, our discharges. We've been sampling our discharges, and um, we've also been sampling uh, TRIBARs. Uh, TRIBAR typically uh, samples the uh, conventional, if you will, pollutants on a weekly basis. They're sampling their, their PFAS on a monthly basis along with ours. So we're trying to coincide them to see how the results from their sampling uh, comes back through our process. And uh, that, you know, we are seeing a decline at, at our point, but uh, we, you know, or we have seen non-detect from the effluent from TRIBAR already, and uh, we're expecting to see um, a, you know, a, a decrease in our effluent as well moving forward. So we're sampling at three different levels, the state sampling, and we, the city of Wixom is sampling through uh, our contract operator, Suez, and uh, TRIBAR is sampling themselves through uh, the contracted lab. Um, Tim, while I have you at the microphone, um, there was a question about your sludge or biosolid disposal, and is that being testing tested, and what's happening to so, it? So we have we have tested uh, our solids in uh, in multiple forums, if you will. We have uh, two land application tanks that uh, we'd previously used for land application uh, in uh, January of 2018. Um, we uh, finished the construction of our uh, presses, which now uh, we press all our solids and uh, they go to a landfill. 
uh, for disposal. And so there are no more, there is no more land application at this time. Um, I know that the DEQ is uh, potentially sampling some of the, the land uh, that uh, has, been, has been used for land application of our biosolids and uh, that we're still awaiting the results for that. Yes, go ahead, Stephanie. Is this on? Okay. I just want to follow up on what Tim just said. So um, at the state level and talking about biosolids, uh, we, we did initially um, had a similar situation that kind of brought us down this path where we're at now uh, with the industrial pretreatment program. It happened last year in Lapeer. Uh, they had a similar industrial source of plater that discharged their plant. Um, and working with them, we looked at the biosolids there. Last year, we actually, um, based on the concentrations we had at LaPierre, went out and did some screening of some fields. So currently, we have a new statewide kind of initiative looking at our wastewater treatment plants, looking at influent, effluent, and biosolids concentrations, and not just on plants that we think we have, you know, PFAS issues, but also on plants that don't have industrial sources and are more just have residential commercial to try to understand, you know, what levels do we have. Um, part of that process and that, that statewide effort is coming to look at additional fields where we, we have both, we have known concentrations that were higher that were applied in the past, and we want to screen those and make sure we understand um, what concentrations are there and is there any risk associated with those fields. And then we're also going to look at some sites, some kind of, I don't know if they're control sites, but some sites where um, we might have had land application from kind of lower levels and, and just understand it more. So that's part of us, it's more of a study and that's something that's um, starting underway now. We're hoping to do some follow-up sampling, probably more um, late winter at this point. Next questions have to do with some of the standards versus advisory levels. And there was a question about why does groundwater have an enforceable standard while drinking water has only an advisory level? Uh, the, the biggest difference between that is uh, the federal versus the state. An MCL is a, is a federal um, level and the, the state of Michigan um, took a proactive approach to set an enforceable standard under 201. So if, if there is groundwater on a site that exceeds 70, uh, PFOS or PFAOA um, above 70, then they are a facility as defined under 201, and as such they have legal obligations as liable owners. So that, that's the biggest difference between the two. But if I'm correct, it is something the state could set, is they could set a drinking water standard, like they did a groundwater standard? I'm looking at other people. I am not familiar with setting drinking water standards. So we might have to, we might have to circle back and, and it, to answer that question. Okay. To, to I, I know it's something that the Huron River Watershed Council and other environmental groups have been advocating is in the absence of the EPA setting a drinking water standard, having the state set one. Okay. Um, other questions? Oh, changing topics a little bit. Um, somebody could talk about food contamination. This has come up um, in terms of agriculture, wildlife, and people then eating wildlife, wild fowl, deer, et cetera. Um, I think we have somebody here from MDARD, is that right? Hello, thank you. Hi, um, I'm from Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. My name is Kevin Bessie. So you've heard everybody here talk tonight about numbers and drinking water and surface water and the, the sampling they're doing and how they're trying to get things down to the standards that have been set. The hard thing about food is there are no numbers. Um, even globally, you won't find anybody who says, this lettuce has a standard and we could test to see if it meets it. It just doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Um, so when you get into food, and whether it's animal food or plant food, you know, it becomes a, a lot of your own judgment. I mean, if you're in an area where you have a known contamination, 
and you're saying, well, I've been watering my garden out of the river. Should I eat the stuff I grow there? Um, that's a tough thing, because I can't give you a number. Even if you tested it and got a number, I couldn't tell you if it was good or bad. So it's a lot of it's making an informed choice. And you go, well, how do I get informed enough to make a good choice? Um, to a certain degree, if you have a question, you can call us, and we'll literally walk you through your site-by-site -site process and with any of the knowledge that we have to help you understand levels of risk and see what your comfort level is. Um, in general, if you're worried that you have some contamination in some food that you've grown, um, it's probably a fairly minor source compared to water if you've had uh, a high level of PFAS in your water. Um, I mean, we generally, the only place we've told people in the state not to eat their homegrown or canned food was over in parchment where we had like 1,400 parts per trillion in the, in the city water. And those people had been drinking high amounts in their city water for probably years and years. And while we didn't have a standard, we're going, they've already had a lot of PFAS, they sure don't need any more. Let's not have them just keep munching it in the food they grew in their backyard, as a, just to be careful. Um, so when, when people hit sort of those big, oh my god, this is really heavily contaminated, I think it becomes easier. I know in New Mexico right now, they have a, a 5,000 herd dairy farm right off the edge of an Air Force base. And they found one of the wells on the dairy, 5,000 herd dairy farm with 10,000 parts per trillion of PFAS in it. So that dairy farm is immediately offline. No one's getting any of the milk. The cows are not going for slaughter. Um, you know, and that, they just put this multi-million dairy farm out of business, basically, because all of his land's contaminated. He used the water to grow the feed that he gave the cows. and. You know, and it's, they've got a real mess. They kind of had their worst, our worst case scenario the first time they went out <laughs> and tested for anything in New Mexico. So we look really heavily at every site that comes up to see if there's any kind of like a commercial agricultural operation there. So far, we've been really lucky and haven't found any commercial ag operations impacted at any of these sites. We've had a few on the edges who had a few questions about some odds and ends, but really nothing compared to some other states that have had some significant issues. So, uh, But generally, I would say there's not a big concern about eating something out of your garden. <sighs> but I said, if you have a specific question and you've got numbers of the river in front of you and you've been doing it for so long, call us and let's talk about that specific thing. You know, you can reduce risk levels by, um, to be safer, don't feed it to children, just have it yourself, just have it occasionally. Like when they put out the fish advisories, they'll oftentimes say, well, don't eat more than maybe two meals a month of this, and that'll lower your exposure, um, and things like that. It's, and, and generally, hot levels in food can probably be a little higher than they are in your water because it's a dose thing. And like in the, in the fish, when they tell you not to eat the fish, they're measuring that at a lot higher level than they are at the water because you don't, you're only eating a small piece of fish once every while. And the same thing with food. If you're just drink, eating a little bit once in a while, you can have more in that food than you have in your water on a regular basis. So where drinking water standard may be here, milk might be here, your lettuce could probably be up here or something. Also with food, if you grow it, these long carbon chain PFAS chemicals generally, and it varies a bit by plant and water and a bunch of stuff, but they oftentimes don't get into the, veg, the, the, the portion of the above ground plant you eat. They're more stuck in the roots. So potatoes and carrots and radishes are more likely to have PFAS in them than lettuce and stuff you grow above ground. There's a, probably a little more PFAS in the skin of a potato than in the middle of the potato. So if you peel the potatoes, you eliminate some of it. So there's some little tricks like that that you can use, but we haven't seen any scenarios where we've told anybody don't, don't eat your, your, home gar your home garden um, other than in parchment where we had a sort of an oh my god situation, I think. Hopefully that helps. And I said, give us a call at Department of Ag and we'll be happy to walk you through any particular scenario and kind of help you diagnose and make an educated decision. Thank you. And I, I know um, both up in Kent Lake with the Huron-Clinton Metropolitan Authority and the city of Ann Arbor, where they do do deer cull and they do donate the deer meat to um, local shelters, they have been getting some of that meat tested um, because of this concern. Um, one of the next questions goes to sort of how 
because we've been using PFAS chemicals um, in our watershed and industry for many, many decades, um, how long does uh, PFAS last in the river, in the environment? Um, you know, I know that it's, it usually travels on the upper column of the water. It isn't something that's contained in the sediment. But then this gets to the question of if we have reduced the inputs from TRIBAR, how long does that PFAS take to flush through the system, and especially in terms of the um, Do Not Eat Fish advisory? Can we expect to see that advisory lifted within a couple years, or are we looking at dozens of years before we can see that? questions that are going to hit a lot of people. You want to start with Joe and talk about the fish advisory part? Uh, well, that is the million dollar question. Uh, the good news is that it, the evidence we've seen in literature is that uh, PFOS in particular, PFOS, the one that we are concerned about in fish, doesn't seem to stay in the fish for an extended period of time if it's put in clean water. So what we've seen is it has a half-life of say nine to 10 months, maybe a year in a fish. So if a fish is exposed to say 100 gram, 100 units of uh, uh, PFOS, it's got that in its tissue and you put it into clean water, then uh, a year later it'll have half that. So it'll have 50 and uh, this is just uh, it's still, the science is pretty um, scarce, basically, but from what we've seen, it stays in the fish for short periods of time. So if you were to completely cut the, turn the spigot off of PFAS in the Huron River, um, that's good news. You could say that, well, the water is going to be flushing through and the fish will then clean up, but that's just conjecture. Um, it could be... It, it, it'll be several years at least, it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, it could be much longer than that depending on how many sources there are, um, how uh, successful we are at, at finding them and, and uh, stopping those sources. Um, and it is a big system, so we don't know where exactly in the system it's, it's uh, being stored basically. Um, and, and the follow-up question is, as, what does it take to lift a fish advisory? Can you hear me? Am I on? Yeah. Okay, perfect. How's that? Okay, um, so there's a couple of things that need to happen in order for the fish advisories to go away. And you know, the first we talked about was you have to clean the water, and then you have to give the fish some time for them to clean. And then there's kind of the, um, you know, the technical work that we do, which is we're sampling the fish with Joe's group, we're getting the data, we're seeing what it says, and especially for a do not eat advisory, when we pull one off, we wanna make sure we're making the right decision. So we don't wanna, you know, we saw earlier, when you look at environmental data, it has a tendency to go up and down, up and down, up and down. And you can have long-term trends, which is what we really care about. Um, we don't wanna sample the fish when it's down this month and then pull the advisory off only to find out, oh, it went back up next month. So we have a process in place where when we start seeing the clean fish in one batch of data, we're gonna wait until probably the next season, the next sampling season, sample them again and make sure that we are seeing a clear trend that the fish are clean. And then once we've got those kind of two batches of data, then we can go through the process of, at MDHHS, removing the actual fish advisories and replacing them with whatever else. Um, so, so you've got those three steps there, and each one can take their time of cleaning the water, cleaning the fish, and then doing the administrative and technical work of removing the advisory. Um, and we move a little slow on that last part because we would rather have an unnecessarily restrictive advisory in place than the other extreme, which is not being protective enough. So we tend to err a little bit on leaving the advisory there for a little too long rather than pull it too soon, if that makes sense. Great. Um, uh, OK. 
Okay, this talked about additional lakes. You, t you talked about some of the additional lakes that were gonna be tested. I think that was addressed. Um, there were some questions about the Lifetime Health Advisory. Um, how is it calculated? Uh, they want somebody to say, please say more about it. Um, is it a 70 parts per trillion over, the, over a lifetime? You know, there, there's a couple questions about it. explain the meaning of, what does it protect? How is it calculated? Absolutely. Um, so we could spend all night doing a crash course in toxicology and you would still not walk out of here knowing all of the nuances of where that number comes from and what it means. Um, so I would just assume not go into all of those details that aren't very much fun. Um, but, but there are some really good questions there and so let's look at that for a minute. Um, so the EPA Lifetime Health Advisory is a drinking water number first and foremost. So we're setting a number in drinking water that we believe everybody can drink every day of their life and suffer no ill effects. Um, this includes if you've got a pregnant mother drinking this, that her unborn child is not gonna be affected. If you're bottle feeding an infant, we are pretty confident that they're gonna be okay if they're drinking this amount, the 70 parts per trillion in the water every day of their life. Now, in order to reach that level of confidence, what we do is we start, and again, this is the magic of toxicology, so we're gonna leave out some details. We would start by doing a rat and mouse study or a number of rat and mouse studies that say, you know, for the vast majority of rats and mice, they can have this much PFAS every day and be okay. But that's not gonna give us absolute certainty for people. So we start with, we're certain rats and mice can have this much every day, but we're talking about people. So let's bring that number down a lot. But then, you know, that still might just protect most people and we wanna protect everybody. So let's bring that number down even further. And we end up doing that, I think we start with the safety number the rat and mouse study gives us and then divide it by, you know, 30, 300, something along those lines. We divide it by quite a bit. So we start with, you know, a rat and mouse can have this much every day and be fine. And then for people, we're down to this much um, just to err on the side of caution. And then we cut that number down again and say, well, you might be exposed in your food, you might be exposed in your consumer products, and you're exposed in your water. So we're only gonna let you have 20% of that safety number through your water. And then we're gonna set aside that other 80% for everything else. Um, so so the, the long and the short of it is, you know, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of hard science that goes into the rat and mouse studies. And then there's a lot of, um, you know, state and federal review that goes into looking at what that study says and then calculating with very, and I wanna stress this, there are very, very, very large safety margins built into that number because you know, most people might be fine drinking 100 or even 1,000 every day, but we want a number that's gonna protect everybody. And so now we're all the way down to that 70 number. Um, and and that's, that's the take home message there. There's a lot of uncertainty in toxicology, so we build in large safety factors to try and um, account for that. Thank you. I, I think the other thing that some of these comments hit on is that there have been additional studies in the last year that suggest that that 70 parts per trillion should be much lower. Uh, there was a report that came out from the CDC and then there's other research. And so I know that there has been some discussion in the scientific community and in the industry about what that appropriate level should be. Uh, changing subjects a bit, going to firefighting. Um, are firefighting testing locations being investigated throughout the watershed? Yeah, oh, currently we are putting together um, various source lists, and one of those lists would include firefighter training locations and also asking questions about uh, firefighting foam usage um, for incidents in general. Okay. Where it had been used for a fire in particular. It has, has part of MPART been inventorying not necessarily firefighting stations, but um, firefighting facilities themselves, fire departments? I know that the fire marshal had, had done some work with surveying the various fire departments okay. to figure out where AFFF foam was, uh, and, but I haven't heard much update from that um, recently. 
Um, most okay. of what we're doing now is looking at some of these additional numbers and, and, and really trying to focus in on some other of the sources we hadn't touched. And, and fire foam, foam usage is one of those usage. Yep. Okay. Um, this question, I, I'm not sure whether any of our panelists have the expertise on this. It's um, uh, This is the background that the state of Michigan had sued uh, 3M about a groundwater contamination years ago. And the question here is, is the state of Michigan pursuing legal action against 3M similar to Minnesota? Do you have anybody? To be honest, I don't, I don't think any of us here are in yeah. any position to answer that question. I apologize. Okay, okay. Um, there were some questions that I will try to summarize that get into short chain and long chain, uh, short chain PFAS, um, and, and sort of getting to if we know about some of the short chain PFAS, why have we decided and why are most of the discussions around PFOS and PFOA? Are there other PFAS chemicals that are potentially more dangerous? Are the short chain a greater risk? Um, yeah, I think that those are mainly sort of the short chain testing es issues. Well, I, I can speak from, I'm not a toxicologist, but I can speak for why I, we in water talk about PFAS um, mainly when we're looking at surface water and wastewater discharges. And part of that is because we have Rule 57, we have water qu quality criteria for PFOS and PFOA. And looking at surface water statewide and wastewater discharges and um, other sources, we are finding PFOS to be uh, kind of the elevated concentration. We're not finding PFOA. And very, you know, I don't think we've had even close to an exceedance of our water quality standards for PFOA. Um, you know, there are shorter chains that are in there, but we don't have criteria at this point to compare any of those shorter chains. And often, um, there are lower uh, concentrations than the actual PFOS. And so, from a water standpoint, that's my answer. Um, Gary, I don't know, or if anybody else wants to add from drinking water or um, other media. I don't have too much to add to that, other than I think, um, you know, as I understand it, and we're getting outside of my expertise a little bit here, so I want to be careful. Um, you know, you get this effect where you look at what chemicals are being used in the highest quantities, and then you study those because they're kind of your biggest targets. And then because you're studying those, those becomes the ones that you have information for. And because they're the ones you have information for, they uh, become the ones that you act on. And then as we, as our, as our vision and as our scope expands, you know, then we begin to stu study other ones and gather information on those and act on those. Um, so this PFOS and PFOA were really kind of the tip of the spear. Um, sometime in the past, people had an inkling that those were our, our, our biggest villains, so let's go after those and research those. Um, there are, you know, there's still emerging information. Um, this toxicology information is very difficult and expensive to develop. So you see the new, the information for the new chemicals comes out slowly. Um, and we're starting to see more information come out from more chemicals as time goes on. And so this is a question that we're going to be answering, you know, into the future. We don't have all of these answers now, but I do think we're doing a good job in targeting the biggest villains first and going after them, you know, with a real vengeance. And then as we learn more, we may need to make some adjustments to our process as we go. Uh, there's a question about Ann Arbor drinking water. Um, and I just want to uh, sort of clarify this with point with Sarah. Um, there was a question that in October of 18 that um, the city's drinking water reached 88 parts per trillion of PFAS. Um, and I just wanted to you to clarify, I did not think your data showed that it was that high. Um, and then there was a question about how, what is your process in notifying the public? So I believe that what that's referring to is the total PFAS number for the drinking water. So um, we, so there's a health advisory level for PFAS and PFOA put together, that's 70 parts per trillion. Um, but then as we are able to detect more compounds, we are monitoring for them. So we now monitor 
um, actually as of today for 24. Um, we have been doing 21 just based on the capability of the lab that we're using. Um, and so yes, in October of 2018, um, the total PFAS of those 21 compounds was 88 parts per trillion. So again, that is, um, we don't have any sort of health advisory information for the additional compounds um, that are being added, those additional, so we have the two that there's an advisory for, and then there's an additional 19 compounds um, that to make a conservative measurement are being added together. So, um, so it's hard to know what to, what to say about that. We know that we had a number, we know that it has gone down since then, um, but in the absence of, of guidelines as far as health impacts, it's really hard to it's hard to know what to do about that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really know what to say other than that. So we, yeah. um, we have a four week lead time or lag, lag time with our results, um, but we are trying to publish the results on the website as we get them so that those are available. Um, in the past, we have not been publishing the total PFAS numbers because again, we have no, I have no way of putting that into context for you. I have no way of saying this is a lot or this is a little. Um, it's just a number that we have at this point. So. Um, Is that an answer, or should I move on to the next question? Um, I think that that, I mean, when we have a, a guideline, when we have a standard, we, we have very strict notification protocols, and we would be notifying within 24 hours, depending on the type of thing. But for this, we have no guidelines. And so, I guess, so we have no guidelines, and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, this next question is for Kristen. Uh, why does Washtenaw County not test well water for PFAS or PFOS, and nor one for dioxane? Oh, all right, I'm listening. Can I, can I turn it on? Okay. How about this one? Yeah. All right. Um, so we don't routinely test for. PFAS or 14 dioxin our lab does not have the capability to do either of those tests, um, but we can certainly connect homeowners with resources if they're interested in how to do their own testing. Right now, we haven't found any sources of PFAS in Washtenaw County that we think are of concern where we would have an advisory for people to uh, encourage people to do testing um, for the 14 dioxin and I know we're not talking about that tonight, uh, but in general, we have looked at our plume and our testing houses that we feel are at risk. Um, and we continue to evaluate that every year and work with the DEQ to do that testing. We would follow a similar process if we had identified a source of PFAS. We would encourage DEQ to um, partner with us to do that testing. Uh, this is a question, exact same question we received up in Milford. Uh, why wasn't Tribar shut down? So, so we, we, kind of, we kind of talked about it with uh, the, the remarks from Sarah just recently. We didn't have uh, anything really to grasp on other than it's a pass-through uh, violation that, uh, that was being discharged. So in a sense, we did shut them down in that uh, we required them to uh, treat their, their discharges to a point where it's not affecting the treatment plant any longer. And that's really the only the only initial um, part of our sewer use ordinance that we could utilize because we didn't have a, a, a limit until uh, we were um, uh, put in, before a limit was put in place through Rule 57, which is the drinking water standard of 11. And so we inst instituted that in their permit and um, by October they 
uh, installed treatment to uh, treat for PFOS and PFOA, and uh, now we're getting results back that they are no longer discharging that into the system. So we, in a sense, we did stop them or shut them down. Yep, go ahead. Was. Hello? Hello? Awesome. Thanks. Hi. Okay. So um, I just want to give some background on the industrial sources like Tribar. Um, we talked about this a lot at Milford. Um, but there is some, you know, information I think that you guys should know about this particular process. So um, based on our, the information we have, we don't think this facility was acting improperly, that they were discharging PFAS. Um, it wasn't something that they know was occurring. Uh, the use of PFOS missuppressants as part of the plating process is something that most of our plating facilities across the nation um, have been using since the 90s. And it was actually, if you talk to them, they'll tell you it was a requirement put on from um, EPA to protect uh, workers and um, health and safety from fumes from like hex chrome plating. So they were using it in their system to comply with run regulation. Once additional information was known about the health impacts of using PFOS-based misoppressants, the EPA changed their regulations and required them to switch out these um, misoppressants with replacement products that still have PFAS but do not have PFOS. Um, and so that was required by 2015. Um, all of information we have is that, you know, Tribar, like other platers in Michigan, complied with that. Um, and so the interesting thing at Tribar that we don't have at some other other facilities where we see similar things happening is that they had two plants. They had plant four and five doing very similar chrome plating activities. They had plant four, correct, was built in 2000, so prior to the PFOS switch. And then plant five was built um, after 2015, so after. Um, they both had the same processes. Uh, the plant four had used the misoppressant that had PFOS. Plant five never used it. They used the replacement product. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the discharge from plant four was very, or plant five was very low for PFOS, whereas the discharge for plant five. So it looks like this is a legacy issue within the system, not that they're um, disposing of it or trying to avoid any. So it wasn't really in our mind when we started looking and working with our wastewater treatment plants to look for these issues, it wasn't necessarily like um, we're going to go out and, and get these guys and they're going to be doing bad things. It's we wanted to understand um, what levels are coming and then use the IPP system that's already in place, the regulations that are already there to address the issue and notify the responsible party that they need to put corrective actions, which Wixom did, and to move forward to meet water quality standards. So I think we're on our way at this point, and I think it was successful. Um, some people want it to be shut off and happen the next day, but in reality, I know I think we're going to get further kind of working it through the program like we've been doing. Tribar has been very successful in uh, you know, working with us on that, and they want to be good corporate citizens, and uh, just like uh, the city of Wixom does not have any plan to, um, you know, discharge any waste that would pro would uh, prohibit, um, you know, fish advisories or or anything. So it's it's not a matter of that. It's uh, we are we now know about the situation. We know that uh, there's there's a, a situation with Tribar, and we've we've approached it. We've identified it. And uh, we're we're trying to uh, reduce the impacts of it right now, while working with uh, within our community. So yes, thanks. There's a bunch of questions about policy, and uh, understandably about what should citizens do, what can we do, what kind of legislation do we need. Um, I, I can take a first stab at this because we do get involved in the advocacy work. Um, much like the state has set a groundwater standard for this, we strongly advocate that state legislatures, legislators should be setting a drinking water standard for PFAS. Um, it could be done at the federal level. We just haven't seen 
the interest at the federal level, uh, we've seen more interest at the state level. So I would say contact your legislators, say you want a drinking water standard set at the state level, you want it fast, they can do them in emergency, through emergency rules, they can do them fast if there is enough demand. Uh, one of the reasons the groundwater standard got set so fast is there's been a lot of groundwater contamination with this. Surface water has been less. As I mentioned, it's mainly been in the Huron. Um, also, in terms of talking about cleanup and filtration, there was questions about whether we could get granular activated carbon across the board. Um, the Clean Michigan Initiative bond funds have dried up. Those are all gone. And currently, there is no money to do cleanup at the state. This is, again, something you should be talking to your legislators about. We need a replacement for the cleanup funds. We need a replacement to d address these emerging contaminants that are continuing to plague us. Um, it talks questions, too, on here of uh, policy enforcement options. In this situation, the DEQ and Wixom Wastewater Treatment Plant have been following the law on what they are allowed to do. If we want better enforcement and cleanup standards, we need to change our laws. Um, and so that's, again, something that you can get involved in with your legislators in advocating for that. Any other comments from the panel? I had a feeling that I would be the one <laughs> being forceful on that, but I welcome any other comments. Okay? Yeah, so uh, I think we've, we've covered everything that we had hoped to cover, and we hope that we've answered all the questions we can. There's a few more, if, you'll, if you'll be willing. Well, um, I'm, there's, I'm still here, so. There's some questions about human health and blood tests. Um, and are there ways, are there health clinics for testing humans? Can you get blood tests? And again, I know this came up at, in Milford. Yeah, so this, this has been a question. Um, I was working at the Richland and Parchland sites in particular, and this was something people wanted to know, because PFAS is new, it's kind of scary, and you know, people find out that they've been drinking this for you know, some extended period of time, and they want to know, how has this affected my health? And, um, you know, un unfortunately, we don't have a good way to answer that question right now. Um, technically, there are blood tests that you can have done that will tell you how much PFAS is in your blood the day you go for the test. There's some drawbacks, though. It won't tell you how much PFAS was in your blood last year or the year before or the year before. Um, and just like we were saying with the food and for some of the non-PFAS or non-PFOS, PFOA, other chemicals, um, we don't have standards for blood numbers. So your doctor could tell you how much PFAS is in your blood. He can't tell you if that's good or bad, and he definitely can't tell you whether or not you're going to have a health impact from that. Um, so what we've been hearing is that um, doctors and some of the medical directors have not been recommending this testing because it's expensive, it's a little hard to find, and then you go through all of this trouble and you get a number and nobody can really tell you what it means. Um, that's an unfortunate answer, but it's the reality that we don't have a good way to answer that question. Uh, the last question that we have, and again, this, there are many of these coming from different angles, um, is asking about resources for individuals. Um, a lot on home filters, a lot on um, Boiling water, does it remove it? How to home test? What are some of the options? I think these have been covered numerous times. I will uh, give a plug again for the website, you know, michigan.gov backslash PFAS response. Um, we have a lot of information about, I would say there's at least something about almost all the things you just brought up. We have some information on that. I know um, Washtenaw County ha has a lot of stuff on their website. Um, and I, and I, I would assume, and, and, and I, I shouldn't just say assume, but I have also seen evidence of, you know, as more information is becoming available, it is becoming more publicly available to other people as well through a lot of other sources. Initially, I think the state PFAS site was one of the only sites that was giving information. Um, and I know a lot of other states are, are using our website and our MPART model to implement their own responses to PFAS within their own state. So okay. I would continue to tell people to look at that website and as things get posted up there, uh, you know, if you have any questions, contact the appropriate people on the website and we'll Great. be more than happy to help. 
Filters can be very effective. Some filters are certified for this, some filters are not. The website has a list of what filters are certified. I would strongly recommend, if you're interested in going down that road, check that list. But more importantly, you mentioned, um, does boiling help? And it's just the opposite. Boiling the water will make it worse because you're evaporating the water and leaving the chemical behind. Um, so this is not like um, maybe you would boil for E. coli or something else. This is, um, this is not something that you can cook out of the water. So with that, we've, we've talked about, uh, we've answered all of the questions. There were a few that had been in the slides um, so I encourage people that if you felt it wasn't answered, please go back and, and look at some of the slides. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out, um, but I also want to give a big round of applause to our speakers and our presenters. Thank you. And for the slides, um, we're hoping by tomorrow or the next day we'll have them up on this website. So thanks for coming. <laughs>